Hi, I'm Rory. And with me, as always, is Ken. Hi, how are you, Ken? I'm well, thank you for asking, Rory. Delighted to be here and so glad that you've joined us, that you've tuned in for the Counselling Tutor podcast. It's episode 224. Three topics we're going to be covering today, starting with our counselling foundations, where we go back to the basics that underpin what we do as practitioners. And we're looking at life scripts from transactional analysis today. An interesting topic, one that I speak about often and I see in myself so, so often. We then go into focus on self, uh, where we recognise that we are the heartbeat of our practice. We need to be okay to be able to be there for others. And today we're going to be speaking about not being defined find by the work that we do. Mm. And then we go into practice matters uh, where we look at an element of practice. And today we're speaking about narcissistic personality disorder. And we have our good friend, Amy Launder, a regular contributor to the Counselor CPD Library. And of course, a regular guest here on the Counseling Tutor podcast. So we know you're going to get some good value from there. Let's go to those foundations, Rory. Life scripts. What are they? Well, it was back in 1972 where Eric Byrne um, defined something called life scripts. And life scripts are exactly what they say on the tin. They are a script that we live out due to basically the things we are told as children. And I'll give you a little example of this that I used to use when I taught. Many years ago, I was in a supermarket, a rather large supermarket, and queuing up to get my tea bags. And one of the um, assistants, one of the people who worked there, had brought her twin children in to show her colleagues, you know, show off your new children. And they were in a little buggy side by side, and they were like two peas in a pod. You couldn't separate them. And she said, here, here they are, and this is, you know, and they gave the name and said, and this is the good girl. And this is the one who's naughty. And I thought to myself, no, please, (laughs) please, because that little child will, will, one of them will go, I'm good. And the other will say, I'm naughty. And if that, I mean, it's, you know, it's what, sometimes it's what we as parents do. We don't do it out of any malicious uh, intent. But if that message is reinforced through the years, then that becomes a script, like an actor would use a script to portray a character. That's exactly what happens. And the things we're told as children then go on to form how we live our life. And I'm reminded of a very sunny um, May afternoon, a good few years ago, where I was explaining this. And one of my students said, no, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe that what you're, what you're told as children um, influences how you become. Absolutely not and I, you know, I, I, I don't have any influences on me, and um, I do as I want, and no one tells me what to do. And it went on and on and on. And I said, you know, when you were little, what did your parents used to tell you a lot? And she thought, and she said, you never do as you're told. <laughs> there it is, <laughs> and there it is. It played out in her, and honestly, it, 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 you know, if I could have slapped her across the chops with a wet fish, um, you, you couldn't have stunned a person anymore. And it was like. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And, and it happens. And we get messages. I mean, a, a classic message, of course, is big boys don't cry. That was a message that I was told. I mean, you know, when I was growing up, big boys don't cry. Be a, be a brave little soldier. And, you know, that, that kind of message is, is still echoes through male experience of showing emotion and is, is so damaging. So life scripts can, can kind of influence how we live our life and, Part of um, a a TA therapist's job is to try and help the client get a new script on the road, Mm. play another part, think how past experiences have influenced the here and now, and try and put a new script on the road. Yeah. I like how you said it's like being an actor, having a script, having something Mm. with you, an invisible script that you pull out from time to time and play out. Um, and it can be based on messaging from from children, uh, from being a child, as, as you've kind of covered there, Rory. It can also be based on life experiences that we experience and then surmise going forward it's going to be the same and that it's going to repeat and play out again and again. And it's interesting how the, the, the theories kind of 
overlap one another when you're speaking about uh, those messages we get in childhood. We look to person-centered therapy. We look to introjected values, the values of another that we take as our truth and we live to that. And in transaction analysis, we have life scripts, which is similar in, in, in some ways. Um, so I'm going to look at it in terms of uh, you going through life uh, and you, um, <clears throat> as a child, you witness your parents break up. So there is a break up in the in 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 the in your parents. And we kind of take out our little script and we go, okay, parents break up, and we write that down. And then you go along a little bit, and then you have your first relationship, the young love, and you're in love, and it's all going great. And then you get dumped. You pull out your piece of paper and you go, hold on a minute. This happened to my parents. Look at this. They, they, theirs didn't last. And you write on there, and obviously this is all happening subconsciously, break up relationship, break up. And then you go into another relationship. And after a few months, what happens? That breaks up too. The person leaves you. You get out your life script and you go, ha ha, here it is. I'm seeing the pattern. Whenever I'm in a relationship, the other person is going to leave me. And this is now the life script. This is now the life script and this person goes on through their life and in, in any relationship they get into, when the person leaves, they take out the script and reinforce it. They get out a big red marker and go, yes, and underline it. You see, this is how it is. This is how life plays out. And what happens subconsciously is this person then starts acting in a way within relationships that will eventually force the other person to leave subconsciously not not knowing what they're doing thinking and it might be well i don't trust this person i know they're going to leave there might be great insecurity and the person will eventually go you know I, I just can't go on with you being like this and the person will go aha you see there it is and there's an example of a life script of how it's written how it's reinforced and every time the script plays out it becomes stronger and stronger they they're difficult to see because we don't see them. It's taking place subconsciously. When we do see them, we will usually defend them. Ah, but I just haven't met the right person yet. Ah, but it will always be externalized. And the work in TA is to recognize this is your life script. You're playing it out. And then only when we accept it is there an opportunity to maybe write it re differently. Yes, I, I like. I really like that, Ken. Write it, write it, re, rewrite your script, and it, it does speak to actually a school of TA called Redecision Therapy, which was developed by Robert and Mary Goulding that, that, that combined areas of Gestalt and TA to um, help people put a new script on the road. The, the, the clue is in the name: Redecision Therapy, making different decisions and deciding that that you know these old actions aren't getting us where we need to be so we need to think of something new and working with that in therapy to develop a new life script but i i tell you what ken sometimes it's not just parents who who are or people that we meet who can write our initial scripts it's also society ken and myself are neurodiverse we're both dyslexic ken ken you know spoken quite often about being a, a, an autistic man and the messages we got in childhood um, were that you couldn't read or write, your penmanship, as they used to call it, can you believe they used words like that, wasn't good. <laughs> and you were, you basically, you were dumped in the, you know, you were, you were a bit thick. I was told on a numerous occasions I was a bit thick. And if I think of my life, I, you know, I think, well, you know, I'm a, a bit thick, I might act a bit thick. And I went through a great proportion of my life not really thinking too much of myself in terms of my intellect, because because society to some extent because they didn't understand this lecture in neurodiversity had written me off and and i'd help write myself off because i'd listened to that and it was only when i met someone into my 20s who said no no you're not you're not you're not stupid you're dyslexic and i'm like what's that and it was only when someone pointed it out and said actually look at the things you're doing you you you, you you're quite you're quite capable it's just that you don't do it in a traditional academic style and that changed everything Ken you know that led me on a path to go to college I went back at 40 years old with no qualifications and uh, it, it led me to making a podcast with you Ken um so so sometimes rewriting our life script is really really important but 
it can be a difficult process because we've got to look at those past messages. It's not, I don't think it's sometimes very easy. From my own experience, I had to look at past messages. Um, they came from all directions, Ken, and, and sometimes from people who should have been caring for you. Yeah, yeah. It, it, for, just what you shared there, Raul, it's so strong, it's so powerful. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many students um, say, oh, I'm not very academic. I'm, I'm not good at this kind of stuff. And I wonder where that comes from and what what wrote that script? Because I certainly shared your script, Rory. I, I think yeah. I had my own copy. I probably <laughs> <fitted it. laughs> Wow, there's a word you don't hear often, focus that. Just that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm showing my age here. Um, a, a, a copy of that exact same uh, uh, script. I was. I, I didn't do well in school because of my neurodiversity. It was never picked up. I was labelled lazy and non-academic. I, I thought I. I'm not an academic. I can't do this kind of stuff. And I look now, um, and I qualified as a counsellor. I, I then co qualified uh, uh, to teach. Uh, I have been involved in delivering supervision training, online and telephone counseling training. I run a training company with you, Rory. That You're an author. Written, you've written a, you've written a couple written of books. books. Yes. Uh, and I'm dyslexic. Oh, I can't write. I'm not good at writing. I'm, I'm an author and I've written a book. And it, and, it, and it takes challenging the script to get to that point. It takes challenging it, looking at it. And it's frightening to challenge a script. This, you know, it, the, you, you great with the uh, re remembering Rory who who said what and it's that that all behavior is goal directed uh Rogers uh, that you. was uh, 19 propositions I think thank 13. you 13 there you go <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> I knew it was there in the theory somewhere see I told you I'm not an academic notice how he pulls out his script and underlines it in red um but it, it it's oh now I can't even remember where I was going on that one. That's a great one. I've I've kind of hit a dead end there. But it, it, yeah, so the the life scripts we we're, we're playing them out. We don't see them. Oh yes, I remember what it is. It's that there is comfort in the script because we kind of go well. I know what's going to come next. I'm going to submit that assignment and it's going to get referred because and when it does get referred, it's like you see, I knew that was going to happen anyway. If it doesn't get referred, it's not even noticed. It's not even notice. There's a whew, oh, I'm lucky I got through that with me not being such an academic. There's comfort because our behaviours are goal directed in not challenging our script. It's it's, uh, it's tricky, but first it needs to be seen. It needs to be seen. It does, and I think even even the the term academic is is an interesting one, isn't it, Ken? Because it, it's almost like saying I'm I'm not one of them. Anybody who writes an yeah. assignment and uses references and quotes books and comes to a conclusion is by default an academic. It's not someone with a, a gown and a cap who sits in an oak panelled room with a full of books um, with a pipe. Don't know where the pipe came from. You know? <laughs> I have a pipe, Rory. <laughs> it was, it's, it's in my vision. So there we have it. And, and it's, it's, it's about saying it's, a, it's about, you know, finding yourself and it is, it is really difficult. And I'm sure there must be some people listening to this who are, who are saying, this sounds a little bit like, this sounds a little bit like me. This sounds like the, the kind of things I'm doing. And, and if that's the case, I would say, you know, get yourself some help, get yourself some therapy. As, as, as my good friend Bob Cook would say, who's a TA therapist, get a new script on the road. And it's, it's not easy to put a new script on the road. But once, you, once you're in a new part and you're playing a new part, then it becomes quite natural. Yeah. And quite and quite easy to do, but that transition can be difficult. But you know, as the as the famous Tony Robbins famously said, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always got. Yeah, yeah, and and it's almost like we bring it into reality. We're reinforcing and playing yeah. out. So you you mentioned the actor. You know, once you've got that script, it's almost like I know what's going to happen in the future because it always goes like this. It always goes like this. And we almost play a part that brings that about. We act in ways that kind of play out the script. One of my really strong scripts that I still, I, I know I still carry this around with me today, and that is people will always let you down if you give them enough time, Rory. Just they'll yes. always let you down. It doesn't matter who that person is. They're eventually going to let you down. Yeah. And, 
you know, I look back at my my life and I look back at my childhood and there, there were some rocky roads there. And I guess I'm, uh, it could be uh, it could be said that I was let down uh, by my primary carers and not that they didn't love me, but the looking back and, and kind of living the life I did. Um, and, and I guess the script may have started there. And I've, I've used it all my life. But, and, and, and what that does is it kind of puts me in a place of, well, you can't really trust anyone because they're just going to let you down eventually. And I'll play out this, this, this script. And every time that somebody says they're going to do something and they don't do it, or uh, uh, says they're going to arrive at a certain time and they don't arrive at that certain time, I'll take it out and go, you see, you just can't trust people. If you want a job doing, you got to do it yourself. And I recognize, I know it's a script and I know it's linked into my attachment style ah. uh, 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 as well, but it, it is there. I'm challenging it. I see it but it's still really hard. And, you know, um, I've been married to Colette now for uh, 22 years. And that took some adjustment of my script. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it yeah. Took some adjustment of my script to, to, to trust another human being so fully uh, and, and uh, yeah. Mm. It, it is it is interesting and, and you're absolutely right it, it, there is a second order consequence to live scripts and that is a is a, is attachment and i i think that when we become stressed what happens is we're liable to go back to our old life script and i think part of that is seeing that stress and saying well got to be careful here got to be careful here and, and it's really strange I, i'll let you into a little secret when when I say we record on we record on the Zoom platform because we're we're separated by about forty miles I think as the crow flies Ken and myself I I'll I'll sometimes I'll sometimes come in a little earlier to the Zoom room and wait and when Pop, Ken pops up I'll go he's turned up <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's a little part of me that goes what why would he do that and it's the same with everyone. When, when that little little bar at the top comes, it says Ken Kelly's entered it, or whoever it is. I go, that's remarkable. It's almost like I really don't right. get why people would turn up. Yeah, because the script says otherwise, doesn't it? This, yeah. They're going to let you down. They're not going to be there. They're not going to show up. Yeah. Yeah. And and if so, and if somebody's a few minutes late, I I I, I literally start getting really nervous. Um, uh, and then when they pop up and they go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a little late. It's like, oh, right, that's okay. But it's, it's, and for all I know, and for all the training and all the therapy I've had and all the personal developments I've done, I still get that feeling. And I still have to, I, I still have to address it and call it out and go, come on, Rory. You know, th this is, this is just an old piece of your script. Let's, let's get it going. And some days it's easier to do than others, if I'm honest, Ken. I don't know about you, but some days I, I can just dismiss it. Some days it's like, oh, it really gets me. <laughs> Yeah, very much so. And and maybe you're listening to this and you can relate to it at some level. I wonder what script you might carry around, what scripts you might see uh, along your training process from peers, what scripts mm. you may see being brought into your 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 therapy room. Yeah. Uh, and I guess understanding it, reading about it, um, developing ourselves and, and our knowledge is, is empowering. And uh, we've got a handout for you on life scripts and you can grab that. It's free. You just go to counselingtutor.com, click on the podcast tab, uh, navigate to episode 224. That's today's podcast. And there it is on the page. We can uh, put in your email address and we'll send you the handout on life scripts. And uh, if there's, if there's anything that is, that I would like to, give us a gift it is that if you can see your own life scripts and start working on them there is amazing personal growth in life scripts i think Absolutely. it's a lovely little theory it's so neat and it, it makes so much sense to me and I, I literally in my head see myself silently pulling out my script and my little red pen and going <laughs> to underline it and i can stop myself in that motion and go hold on a second this this is circumstance that this other person is not here or whatever it is yeah. and i can rationalize it put the pen away ken put the yeah. pen away and yes. not in and not underline that script just to challenge myself yeah i always say to myself come on rory you're not six you're 64 yeah. you know which kind of takes me away from that child place the script was written in and brings me into the here and now and, and, and very much the adult 
ego state, you know. So, but it, it is interesting, isn't it, how we're, we're defined by our history, Ken? Indeed. And more than one theory suggests this. So yes. there it is. That is our counseling foundations that, that underpins uh, us and our training, learning to become counselors. We now move on to that focus on self where we recognize you. You're the beating heart of your practice. And we need to be okay in ourselves to be able to be there for others. And it's very easy. Uh, being a counsellor to be defined by the work you do. Somebody says to you, oh, who are you? You might say, well, I am a counsellor. And you're defining yourself by a job role or title. But we can also define ourselves by the work that we do. And I guess there is there is a, a challenge within that, Rory. Yeah, there is, I think there is a challenge. And I think that, you know, the training and, and practice, it can be called come all-encompassing. Yeah. And, and eventually... Um, we see ourselves only in the work that we do. So when people say, you know, if people say, who are you? Um, then um, we might say, oh, I'm a, I'm a counsellor. But is that all you are? Isn't there a lot more? And in fact, in fact, I've, I've recently had some coaching and <clears throat> what we had to do was write a personal statement about ourselves. And one of it was, who are you? And I wrote, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, a father, a, a husband, a father, a grandfather, and a business owner. And I put I put the business owner at the end. I put them in the order of importance. Mm. <laughs> and, and that was really, really useful because it reminds me that I have other commitments. I'm, I play other roles in the world. And I think it's very easy if it, to get to get overdefined by who you are if all you do is is work, because you'll only you'll only meet people who who are doing the same work and eventually you just think of yourself i am and it's that it's that it's that kind of societal thing as well if you go to a party now we can in post-covid world we can meet people people usually say to you at some point what do you do in other words they're saying am i are you are you the same kind of person as me and i think it's really interesting how people react they'll usually talk about the jobs he won't talk about themselves. He won't say to things like, what do you do? Well, I'm a grandfather and I kind of play with children and have fun and, and buy ice creams and that type of thing. People would usually say, well, I'm a, you know, I'm an accountant or I'm a, I'm a, a bricklayer or I'm, I'm, I'm whatever job we are. Don't get defined by your work. Be defined by who you are is my message. Yeah, that's a great message. It's so tricky to live by it. Um <clears throat> And we get captivated by our work and, and, and we may love what we do, you know, and when we look around us, we may f see that our, our friends are also peers. They're also uh, involved in the same kind of things that we do. We may find that the, the, the interest groups that we, that we hang out in also share the interest of the work that we do. And it's about where's, where is that balance? You know, where is that balance? And it doesn't matter what work you do. Like you said, Rory, you could be, I'm an accountant. Uh, you'd be in all the Facebook accountancy groups then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not in any. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, as, as counsellors, I think that this takes it a, a, a step further because when we define ourselves by what we do, think about it when, when, we, when we are a counsellor, when we're in the role of a counsellor, now, first of all, we're talk about, t told it as a way of being. It's not what we do, but it's who we are, which is interesting in itself. So we're in the role of a counsellor. We may be uh, taught that we must have unconditional positive regard. And then what happens when you kind of get yourself in a situation where somebody pulls you off or takes your parking spot in, in a car park? Do we, do we then go, I can't feel that anger that is building up in me now or that frustration pick an emotion that is building up in me now because because i am a counselor and i am i i view everybody without judgment and they're just being who they are or, or do you go well i know what i do yes <clears throat> and it, yeah. <laughs> it tends towards the side of things yeah, uh, yeah. And, and I guess in the, the, there is a, a challenge in defining ourselves in a certain way because we cannot live up to that. We can't be that all the time. And when we, we, we may then feel that we're letting ourselves down, that we're not being who we're supposed to be. I'm supposed to, I can't feel like this because I'm a counsellor. Well, you're a human being. You're a human being first. Yes, ab ab absolutely. And, you know, I've got a picture, Ken, of maybe, 
you know, stood in your stood in your house with rain pouring through your roof mm. and phoning the builder up who's supposed to come to re-roof your, your house and them saying, Well, I've had some difficulties, and you're saying, Oh, I understand that. You know, never mind that, get a tarpaulin up, get some slice up. I don't want wet carpet. And and I, I think that's I think that's okay. We may through the arc of of our work become more empathic, more understanding, more non-judgmental. Yeah. But I've always said it's it's a volume control. It's like a volume and treble and bass control on your hi-fi system. You know, you can turn them up and you turn them down. And there are some times where, quite frankly, I've not been very empathic and I've been incredibly judgmental and, and given people a piece of my mind. And sometimes I, I haven't got a problem with that. You know, I might kind of retrospectively think, well, if it was a bit too harsh, but once the deed's done, the deed's done. But I think it's very, very important that we see ourselves as in, holistically and not just define ourselves. And, you know, I, when I worked, um, when I worked with, um, in, in addictions, I, I, I worked in a hostel for a time as a support worker. I met wonderful, wonderful people who, who were working with, uh, people who were going through quite, quite a lot of difficulty and, and by that being difficult in the way they behaved. And, I, I, and a lot of them burnt out because they could only see themselves in one aspect. And I, I think, you know, embrace all of you. That's, that would be the message. Embrace every bit of you. And next time someone asks what you do, take the advice of one of my former students who said, um, who was a very well qualified mental health worker before she, she trained to be a, 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 a counselor with me many years ago. And she tells people she was a secretary. Her words, she said, I'm a secretary. And she said, I have a nice, quiet life <laughs> no one asked me anything <laughs> yeah how you define yourself is is so so important and when we when we define ourselves with with elements of our work um it's challenging and it's a it it, it can be something that we carry you know i i, I was contacted by a, a really good friend just recently and and this really good friend has has done a little bit of counseling training um, and he was sharing uh, that he finds it difficult when those around him, his friends uh, or acquaintances, maybe maybe going through a challenging time, to not to to not kind of slip into that mode of of I, I should be helping here, I, I could be helping here. How should I say? What should I do? How should I listen to this person when they bring me this? That when the people are sharing that their challenges from life. Um, and what he was experiencing was that being defined by the fact I've done a little bit of training. I know all of this. I should be acting differently in these kind of conversations. And and he was sharing, you know, there are times that it's actually just quite frustrating, and he wished that they wouldn't reach out to him. And 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 that is that 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 is, I guess, being real. Um, and and I think that the challenge here is what is your balance? What do you do to mm -hmm. hold the balance within? your life what are your downtime activities uh how do you switch off uh what do you do what are your hobbies and it's interesting you know on on so many forms is what what are your hobbies and people will, will, will write things like watching television but that that's kind of a, a a hypnotic pastime where you sit there and click, turn down what what do you do that is an interest outside of your work um even if you're studying you know it's it, it can be all consuming it can it can take up so much of your waking moments just with thoughts of what it is that you do yeah absolutely can and um, uh, it just it just reminds me what are your hobbies I, I remember that was the first question i was asked when i went for my counseling placement nearly 20 years ago they said and i thought what a strange question you know i'm, I'm coming here to be a placement counselor not to talk about my hobbies but now, of course, with hindsight, I realized he wanted to make sure that I had more dimensions, that I was a multi-dimensional person as opposed to a one-dimensional person. And it's it really is, it really is so important. And um, and I also think, Ken, that when you do the work we do, we we tend to make friends with people in our profession who do the same kind of work. We we kind of gravitate towards like-minded people. And I'm honestly struggling to think of the amount of friends I've got who aren't therapists. I can yep. think of a few, but majority of them are. And it's noticeable when we meet up, we will talk about all sorts of things and not, and not therapy. We'll make a point 
of talking about our kids or where we're going or, um, you know, someone was buying a new house the other week, we were talking about that and trying not really to go onto that therapeutic land so that, so that we, there was more to us, you know, we were multidimensional. Yeah. And we bring this topic in service of focus on self, uh, but it is also in service of, of, of our clients because we may, may have a client who is, who is coming in and is, is defining themselves by what it is that they do. Um, and to kind of close it off, Rory, I was speaking to a, uh, a friend recently who is also a colleague, also in, in the counselling world, uh, and we were talking about our shared enjoyment of Star Trek. <laughs> oh no! Well, that's that's all fl flipping. I can't say that flipping therapy as well, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I can hear the beeps now. Beep, beep. <laughs> I, think I, I think I got away with it. Yeah, you got away. Yeah, 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 no, it. but no one had noticed. But yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. And you know, I, I, I could, I could, I could talk about how there's very close connections between therapy and Star Trek, it given enough time. But I guess that is a outside interest, isn't it? That's nailed it. You're absolutely right, Ken. There it is. That's focus on self. And uh, we now move on to practice matters. That's where we look at elements of practice. We anything from running our practice and the day to day business of a practice or presentations that may come uh, to us within our practice. And uh, Rory, you met up with Amy Launder. Now, Amy Launder is a, a good friend of Counselling Tutor. She has a number of lectures in our Counselor CPD library. But the topic is an interesting one. Narcissistic personality disorder. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, Amy is a firm favourite with, with, with people who view the lectures. The people wax little about Amy's delivery style and, and the topics that she brings. But yes, a narcissistic personality disorder is always seen in quite a negative light. It, it's, it's kind of bandied about as almost people being bad or, or sometimes even the word evil is, is connected with it. But it is a struggle for people. You know, having a narcissistic personality is a struggle. And sometimes people go to get some help with it and try to alleviate the, the more florid symptoms of it. It's, it is a very, very difficult presentation. And I spoke with Amy Launder about how therapists work with a narcissistic personality disorder, and this is what she had to say. And we welcome back one of our regular presenters, Amy Launder, who's done a fantastic lecture on narcissistic personality disorder. Amy, Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. Oh, it's an absolute it's an absolute pleasure. <clears throat> um, the term narcissist is is used a lot in in modern parlance, a lot of vocabulary, isn't it? But there is a big difference, I think, between someone having narcissistic traits and someone being a having narcissistic personality disorder. Maybe we could start with that. What are, what are narcissistic traits? Yeah, I mean, narcissistic, it's the same with any um, diagnosis, I guess. People can have some of the symptoms or some of the traits, but not necessarily enough to meet the criteria for a diagnosis of a personality disorder. Um, but I suppose the way that I would differentiate it is narcissistic traits. They can come and go in a person, maybe depending on the situation they're in or what's going on at that point in their life, whereas a personality disorder is more enduring, you know, it's part of their, their personality, their makeup as a person. So it doesn't doesn't necessarily come and go like like the traits might. Okay, so if we're thinking about traits, and there's a lot there's a lot of this discussed in popular psychology magazines, isn't there? Mm -hmm. What 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 are those traits? How would we kind of think, mm, I wonder if this person has narcissistic traits? Yeah, so someone who thinks very highly of themselves, thinks that they're better than people around them, thinks that other people are jealous of them or becomes very jealous of someone who they believe is better than them, which is very rare for them to believe someone is better than them. But they do, they will identify someone who, who they think is better than them and they will think that they themselves should be associated with that person. So they want to be associated with people who are who they deem to be of equal level or higher than them so that they can then raise themselves as well and look down on anyone else who 
they don't deem to be of their level. Yeah, so somebody who may um, look up to, a, say, a sports person or a, mm-hmm. a personality and say, you know, I want to be like, I want to be like them. And it, it must be really difficult if you're in a relationship with someone who has narcissistic traits. How might that play out in terms of the person in the relationship? Yeah, well, fun, that's actually how I became interested in this narcissistic personality disorder was clients coming, having been in relationships with someone with narcissistic traits. And it comes across in, the so the person who has been with someone who's narcissistic ends up very confused about the relationship, about kind of feeling like they've done something wrong and that's why the relationship has ended or that's why the person has been so horrible to them because the narcissist in the relationship will do everything to break that break their partner down to make make their partner easier to control so they're very sarcastic they use gaslighting a lot so they'll say horrible things and then say that you're too sensitive or you're overreacting and and claim that it was just a joke or something like that and if the partner tries to leave the narcissist the narcissist will do everything they can to kind of hoover them back in. That's that's actually the term that is used in in narcissistic research is hoovering. Um, Only for the narcissist to then leave them when they decide it's time and will do everything at that point to break them down even further and make them feel unlovable because they want to win the breakup, which is a very strange thing to think of winning a breakup, but they want to they want to move on first, move on better, and make sure that their partner can never move on from them. Yeah, it, yes, and, and I watched your lecture, and, I've, and I have to say it's absolutely fascinating. And one of the things that struck me was that a narcissist may may initially meet someone, and s- some of their traits may be very appealing. And I think one of the things you um, gave an example of was as someone might have a really good job and they meet someone and say, oh, this is really good, you've got a good job. And then as time goes on, they say, well, it's your job that's the problem because it's it's interfering with our relationship. Yeah, definitely. It's, and it goes back to what I was saying before about they want to associate with people who are higher than them because they want to, in a relationship terms, they want to show off to their friends, look who, look who I got as a partner. Um, but then that becomes threatening to them that their partner is seemingly higher than they are in some way. So then they try to break that part down. So it's a never ending cycle of wanting someone who's better than them, but then feeling threatened by that. And they keep going. Yes. And, 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 you know, like you, I have, I have um, worked with people who, who have had partners who have been narcissists. And I, I, I think it's very easy to demonize people with this difficulty, but, before we started recording the conversation, we uh, our podcast, we, we we discussed the origins of narcissist and the Greek god who, I mean, maybe you want to tell that story because I thought it was a fascinating story of the reflection in the water. Yeah, of course. Well, that, there's a lot of different retellings of it, but the, the best one that I've come across is that narcissist felt, thought so highly of himself that he believed no one else could, no one else was worthy of his love and actually to the point where a lot of people who a lot of people would um end their own life was to try and prove their love for him uh, he was eventually punished by the gods and made to fall in love with his own reflection in the water so much so that he couldn't even pull himself away to to eat or drink and then he eventually died so he became victim of his own narcissism and that's where the term originally came from yes and i, I think that for people who have um um, narcissistic personality disorder. Maybe we'll just kind of try and try and separate that from people with narcissistic traits. Mm-hmm. And that that must be very very difficult. That they they must struggle with that too because you you said that the, the person the, the Greek god or the Roman god, I think it was a Greek god, mm-hmm. died because that they were so infatuated with their own self that they, mm-hmm. they neglected a bigger part of them. Yeah, definitely. And actually, the the best modern version that I found of that is, I don't know if you've watched Suits or anyone listening has watched Suits. There's a character called Lewis and he's a lawyer and he can't get out of his own way because whenever he feels that he's been slighted, even though he can see the bigger picture, he will do everything he can to get revenge and that ends up knocking him down again. So he can't get out of his own way because he 
the idea that someone thinks poorly of him just can't compute and he you know yeah ends up destroying himself just just to try and, try and save his yeah. reputation so so as with the greek god narcissist the the, the mm. They, that person destroys themselves as well. So so that kind of brings me on to my next question. What is the difference between someone who has narcissistic traits and someone who may have a narcissistic personality disorder? Yeah, well, I think it goes to the diagnostic criteria and how many of the traits do you actually have and how enduring are they? And the difficulty is, is that a lot of people who, are ha who have narcissistic traits or narcissistic personality disorder don't present themselves for treatment or diagnosis because they don't believe there's anything wrong with them. So it's, it's normally in other people presenting someone, like we just said with our clients who have come with, having been with narcissistic people. Um, so yeah, it's very difficult to diagnose and treat because they don't turn up for treatment. Yes, because they think there's nothing wrong with them. Mm. It's everybody else that's the problem. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and when they do turn up for treatment, they turn up to rant about how everyone else is against them and the world is out to get them. So, so that that again then what makes me wonder is is it something that is treatable or is it is it something that people may just have to live with? Yeah, well, like with lots of personality disorders, I would say it's not necessarily treatable, but it's manageable through something like therapy. Yes, um, but very difficult again because they don't want to turn up for treatment most of the time and when they do it's they want a therapist who is going to always agree with them who's not going to tell them anything new about themselves because that injures their ego the idea that someone else knows something about them that they didn't already know so they're very difficult clients to work with yes and and you know it, it cannot be easy to have any form of personality disorder and mm -hmm. you know I, you know i know people who, who really do I think, I think a lot of people would struggle to have a personality disorder. The, the origins of a narcissistic personality, where would, where, would we find, where would we find that? What kind of conditions in, a, in, in, in an earlier life would mm. cause someone to, to develop a narcissistic personality? Yeah, well, um, unfortunately, there's nothing definitive about where it comes from. There's a lot of theories about you know, maybe it's when a, when parents treat a child as very special as in as they're growing up. And so they never really grow out of this idea that they're not special or that they don't deserve everything that the world has to offer them. Um, other theories are kind of the complete opposite, that they were not treated as special or, that, you know, something traumatic happened to them and they overcame it. And, you know, they believe they're special for that reason. So it's there's not really any definitive idea of where it came from there's lots of things so there's there's lots of things but there's no there's no actual research research so mm. I, I guess if, i guess what i'm hearing is we're more likely in our therapy rooms to to encounter people who have been i'm going to use the term very thoughtfully victims mm -hmm. of someone with a narcissistic personality than somebody who is um who, who has a narcissistic personality because by the very nature of it they think there's nothing wrong with them so thinking about those people who are who present how how do we how do we help them what what insights can we gain mm. to to be able to help someone who's clearly um being gaslighted or is a, a victim of someone with a narcissistic personality yeah well there's a lot of psychoeducation and validation that needs to happen with someone who has been the victim of narcissistic abuse purely because they've been made to believe that they are the ones at fault or that there's nothing actually bad happened and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, the main bulk of the work is psychoeducation validation. A lot of patients, a lot of, um, I think the research says that a victim of abuse will return to the relationship on average seven times yes. before fully kind of leaving. Um, so there are, you know, your client might end up going back to the relationship and, and back out again whilst they're in therapy, or they might have already done that and now they're in therapy. Um, so yeah, a lot of patience and understanding, um, but also pointing out the red flags maybe that they're not seeing at the same time. Yes, and and the, the you know one of the things that I know from my own practice when I've worked with clients who've you know been quite clearly in a in a relationship with someone who has narcissistic traits is the fact they're not the the person with the traits isn't going to change. 
mm-hmm. that, you know, I, I don't know how often you've heard this, that, oh, and I'm going to use the word he because mm-hmm. he usually is a he, but I, I acknowledge that women can have narcissistic traits as well, but mm-hmm. he, 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 he's changed. And, and, and it's usually, isn't it, when the partner feels stronger the, the, the danger lies because they feel stronger. They, f- they feel at that point they can control the person. And, of mm. course, that's not the case. Is that, is that your experience? Yes, definitely. So there's, there's always this idea of there's going to be a better day. You know, the, the person has changed. And there's actually a cycle. But once I noticed it, I started recognising it in a lot of clients where when the client leaves the partner or threatens to leave the partner then goes back to this what it's called the the love bombing or honeymoon stage where they're super nice and buying presents and taking them out for dates and that's what hoovers the client the partner back into the relationship and then they go through the whole cycle again and get to the point of devaluing and and all of these things so um but actually interestingly there's research that says that the brain of people, the brains of people who have been victims of narcissistic abuse or any abuse like this, is similar to kind of addicts, gambling addicts, because it's that idea that um, it's like intermittent reinforcement. So you never know when the next good day is going to come, or you never know when the win is going to come on the slot machine. So you keep going to see when that's going to be, and you get addicted to that relationship, even though you know it's not good. How how absolutely fascinating. What do you hope that people who watch this lecture will take away from it? I think that it's that there's a difference between being a narcissist and having narcissistic traits. Um, not everyone who has narcissistic traits is a bad person. You know, there's there's research that the the prevalence rates of narcissism in the general population are zero to two percent or something but in the medical profession it's about 17 percent so you know it's not always a bad thing and it can be used in a good way but it's when it gets in the way of that person's life or the you know the partners and children's lives that it becomes an unhealthy thing well i have to say ab i i get the privilege of watching the lectures before they're actually broadcast and I have to say, I was absolutely riveted by it. it it's, you know, if, if you're interested in this type of thing, or your clients presenting, it really, it really isn't a lecture to be missed. So, Amy Launder, thank you so much for joining us. Big thank you to Amy Launder. Thank you to you, Rory, for hosting that interesting interview, bringing it to our podcast and our listeners. And of course, if you want to uh, listen more to Amy Launder and see her lectures, including the lecture on narcissistic personality personality disorder, you can do so in the Counselor CPD Library. It is a library for qualified practitioners, and you can get more information on that by going to counsellingtutor.com. This has been episode 224 of the Counselling Tutor podcast. Yes, we started with Counselling Foundations, life scripts in transactional analysis, how those early childhood experiences form a script that we live to and sometimes need to change. Then we moved on to focus on self, about not being defined by our work, being the whole of us, not just the work we do. And then we moved on to Practice Matters, an interview with Amy Launder, where she talks about narcissistic personality disorder. And as always, stay grounded and stay safe.